Welcome to the Faster Podcast by Flow Cycling, the podcast where we talk about anything and everything that makes you faster on your bike. This is episode 31, and today we have nutrition expert Bob Sebahar joining us on the show. Bob helps athletes learn how to become better fat burners with sound diet and exercise advice. If you want to lose fat, increase muscle, and improve your body's ability to use fat for energy, this episode is for you. Hey, this is Chris with Flow. When we're not producing this podcast, our team at Flow is designing some of the fastest carbon fiber bicycle wheels in the world. As a thank you for being a listener of our podcast, Faster by Flow, we wanted to offer you 20% off your next purchase of wheels at flowcycling.com. Head over to our website and pick up a set of wheels to make you faster at your next race or ride. Simply use coupon code PODCAST, that's P-O-D-C-A-S-T, in all uppercase letters when checking out to get 20% off your order. Thanks again for listening to Faster. We hope you enjoy the show. All right, Mr. Bob Sibahar, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. Thanks so much for having me. Awesome. Well, it's uh, I'm very excited to have you on the show. We've been doing some work with the Canadian cycling coach, Steve Neal, on fat max wattage and how to pr- improve that uh, based on training. And as we learned with him, diet is 75% of that equation. And you basically are the the master of everything to do with diet and optimizing your fat burning capability. So, so happy to have on have you on the show. Oh, thank you. Yeah. You are based in Colorado. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. Just outside of Denver in Littleton, Colorado. Okay. And do you do any testing or something in Arizona? I thought... You mentioned I, Arizona at one point. I don't personally. I've got some of my level one metabolic efficiency training specialists. Uh, one gal is down there that does testing, but I've got these, I call them level one METs. They go through my certification. They're kind of planted all around the country. And, and as you mentioned with Steve, Steve's in Canada, that some of them actually offer uh, testing, metabolic efficiency testing. So perhaps you may may have heard of that. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure, but yeah, that's- Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. I, am in, I am housed in Colorado. Cool. And a quick story before we get into this, I just did Leadville. Um, and when I was up there, I knew I was going to interview you on the show. We'd never met in person. And I was walking through the expo with a friend of mine also doing the race and he had a book. And I looked, I said, man, that book is so good. You have to buy that book. I look up and Bob's sitting there because yeah. he was the author of the book. So really cool experience to actually get to meet you in person before the show. Sometimes I don't get to do that. So I know was that was, uh, that was kind of cool the way it worked out. Right. Awesome. Yeah. And actually, just so, so, the, so the listeners know, um, Bob asked me how my Leadville went. And I think this is the perfect episode because nutrition was my biggest problem at Leadville. Um, I will give a quick recap. Uh, the race went really well um, until about the top of Columbine, which is probably four and a half to five hours into the race for me. And I noticed that <clears throat> something wasn't feeling right. And my nutrition plan going in was to eat a, a Bobo's bar every 90 minutes and then take salt and water separately. So I personally have never done an event over four hours. And I knew that nutrition was kind of this black hole that I didn't know how it was going to work out. Well, it turned out I did nutrition wrong. So I get to the bottom of uh, Columbine, which is probably five and a half hours into the race. And between uh, Twin Lakes Dam and the base of Powerline is a 20 mile section. And I looked, I remember I was looking down at my power meter, feeling like I should have been doing maybe 180 to 200 watts. And my power meter was saying 40 to 50 watts. <laughs> so. Uh, I tried to try to get it back together. I got to power line. I walked a good portion of that because I was literally doing baby steps with 143 heart rate. So I ended up sitting on the side of the trail for 20 to 30 minutes, which is the first time in my life I've ever stopped in a race. So that was a bit of a humbling experience. But uh, a, an athlete uh, gave me a SIS gel shot, which was like a miracle elixir. And it, it actually got me back on the bike. And I was able to finish pretty strong. I think I finished in 1022 which considering a, you know, probably hour and a half to two hour meltdown wasn't too, too bad of a time. So anyway, I, the reason I tell that story is because people know that I was doing the event and I think that nutrition is such a huge part of these events. And Bob, you're the nutrition master. So I'm really excited to talk about all of that on the show today. Oh, thank you. Me too. Me cool. too. <laughs> awesome. Okay. So the first thing I want to cover are energy system basics. And mm-hmm. this show is going to be about burning you know, being a car burner or a fat burner uh, in the endurance sports world. But, and we're going to get into that on a deep level. But I thought it would be helpful for the listeners to get a basic overview of all of the energy systems in the body 
and how they relate to cycling before we get into to discussing specifically carbs and fat. Okay, yeah. so I did a little bit of research. Uh, I'm not an exercise physiologist, but let's start with my basic understanding of this. So I think the first energy system is known as the phosphagen system or the ATP phosphocreatine system. Can you talk a little bit about that system and how it relates to cycling? Yeah, so it's it's interesting just to preface this. You know, it. I, I guess to dispel this myth, a lot of people, a lot of athletes I talk to, they either think they're burning carbs or fat, right? And it's very seldom do you any at any at one time burn one macronutrient, uh, unless it is as we're entering entering this energy system discussion. This ATP, what's called PCR system, that is, I mean. You know, you've, you've heard of cyclists and athletes taking uh, creatine, right? So basically they're trying to build up these phosphocreatine stores inside their body. And this is, this is very, I guess you could call it explosive energy. Um, it is energy that will give you about 10 seconds, if you're lucky, maybe 12 to 15 seconds, just of raw power, just maximal sprint. It's finish line sprint. It's, it's, it's really, it, it really in cycling, it is a finish line sprint energy system. Okay. Um, but it, again, it's only about 10 to 15 seconds. Some people say 10 to 20 seconds, but it, the, the interesting part of this though is explosive energy. It, it, only regenerates it takes about four to five minutes to regenerate this system so it's if you're thinking about the efficiency of it it's actually not that efficient which is why we can't you know when we do intervals like max sprint you know vo2 max intervals anaerobic type sprint intervals we actually need a lot of recovery time you know just spinning our legs out in zone one in between them because physiologically the body just cannot restore those in under four or five minutes okay Okay. Yep. Very cool. Now, if you've, let's say you've been racing for two hours and you've mm -hmm. been using the other systems, do you still have access to that ATP system? You if do. You go yeah. Really, really it's, hard? Okay. it's always hanging out there. So if you, you know, if you were to start a sprint, uh, you know, all out sprint about 10 to 15 seconds, you max out your ATP PCR, then you go more into your, your, um, anaerobic system. And then, I mean, aerobic is always hanging out also, but yep. it predominates. It depends on, on really the duration and intensity of efforts, but yeah, you'll always okay. have that ATP. ATP PCR in your back pocket when you need it. Perfect. Okay. The second energy system is the anaerobic energy system or the lactic acid system. Can mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about that and how it relates to cycling? Yeah. So that one is usually, we talk about that up to about two to three minutes of effort. So a lot of times when people do uh, some either over geared or higher threshold, supra threshold, even VO2 max, roughly speaking. Um, that's, that's really like when people think of intervals, that's really the energy system most cyclists are utilizing during their one to three minute intervals. Um, okay. that's, that's, you know, FTP increasing. That's trying to really, you know, get the IF above 100, 120%. That's the energy system. It's, it's interesting though, because you, you know, it's, it's lack of oxygen, so to speak. And, and a byproduct is certainly lactate, lactic acid. But I think there's also a misnomer that lactate is not bad. It's actually a, a fuel source that our body can use. But when overproduced, meaning you, you're, you're producing too much than you can clear, that's yep. when you start feeling like, wow, I need to slow down. And it's not necessarily the lactate that's, that's, a, that's making you slow down. It's the hydrogen, hydrogen ions. Right? Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. the ions associated with that that's actually creating more an acidic uh, uh, relation in your, in your muscles. Okay. Yeah. And then the final energy system I think that we use as cyclists is the aerobic or oxidative yes. system. Can you yes. talk a little bit about that, that one? That one. So, so again, the misnomer is, oh, we're, we're only using the aerobic energy system. If we go two, three, four or five hours, we're always using it. And, and in fact, if you look at exercise physiology textbooks, it's just in minimal amounts. When we start, like if you're using the anaerobic energy system, there's still a contribution of aerobic. It's just a very small amount until you start getting past that two to three minutes. But that's kind of the sweet spot in terms of, you know, obviously from a training perspective, trying to improve your body's metabolic efficiency or fat adaptation, but it's also a sweet spot for just training adaptations. And a lot of cyclists, like that's your, those are your long rides. Those are, you know, where you're trying to keep your heart rate under a certain beat per minute to try to maximize, you know, a lot of, a lot of cyclists or coaches relate that into like a zone one or zone two uh, right. model, but that's that's really like the bulk of time spent, especially in base training or preparatory cycle for for cyclists. Perfect. Okay, so here's here's my level of understanding of this. So 
My understanding is that the aerobic system uses oxygen to break down either carbs or mm -hmm. fat to produce energy. Mm -hmm. So for clarity's sake, when we hear people talking about being a carb burner or a fat burner, mm -hmm. we are talking about what fuel source, either carbs or fat, is fueling their aner or, sorry, aerobic system. Is that correct. correct? For the most part, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Absolutely. So that's a high level view of that. Okay. A high level view. So then yeah. Okay. And then does does fueling your aerobic system with carbs versus fat have an effect on the anaerobic system or the phosphagen or ATP energy system that we just talked about? So the phosphagen ATP, not so much uh, because that's okay. more of a, a creatine, phosphocreatine based. Um, but the anaerobic, absolutely. That second one we talked about. So usually for that anaerobic energy cycle, it's pulling most, uh, actually predominantly focused on carbohydrate metabolism, uh, glycogen breakdown, glucose delivery to the body, you know, using either glucose, and or lactate uh, pyruvate uh, as an energy source. So that is predominantly carbohydrate driven. The aerobic energy system is where we actually start to talk about the fat introduction a little bit in terms of supplying energy. But, but again, here's the thing. We in the aerobic energy system, we can gather energy from carbohydrate and or fat and we can train the body either way. And that's, that's the beauty of it. And I love having these discussions with, with some athletes and coaches who say, oh, no, we, you know, we want to be a sugar burner, a fat burner. I'm like, well, you actually can um, depending on the dietary influence that you introduce into your body. So, you know, you're, okay. and I know we're going to get to this, but our body stores carbohydrate and fat in way different amounts, but oh, they're, yeah. <laughs> they're there, right? It just depends on, I mean, a lot of people in the past have thought, oh, it's just the intensity of exercise that predominates one or the other macronutrient from being utilized. And it's not like you mentioned it early on when you mentioned Steve, like exercise, specifically aerobic exercise, the contribution to that in, in terms of on the mitochondrial enzymatic level of improving fat oxidation is only 25% of this whole game here. 75% yeah. yeah. is, is diet related. Okay. So does be, if, if you're a fat burner, let's say you're burning predominantly fat, does mm -hmm. that give you, does that just give you more carbs to use in the anaerobic system or does Great it actually question. improve the Great. anaerobic system as well? Fantastic question. So there's a little bit of unknown with this because aside from just a few years ago, we weren't able to really measure muscle glycogen aside from doing a muscle biopsy. And I say we, I'm not talking about me. I'm not a PhD researcher in a lab. <laughs> okay. Like I'm, I've had many muscle biopsies on my quads in grad school, but it is, it is not, I'm not doing them right. Very yeah. invasive. And I mean, literally you're sticking a needle into the leg and you're snipping oh, away a piece yeah, of I've muscle. I've heard they're fiber. terrible. They're not, they're not great, right? Um, so, so recently, last few years, there's been a company that has, has gotten more of an ultrasound technique of measuring this. I'm not completely comfortable yet with the, the 100% accuracy of that. The reason I'm telling you this is we, if, if we adapt our body into using more of our energy stores from fat as energy, right? We should yep. be able to preserve or i.e. store carbohydrate in the muscle much better, which means if we're using more fat at, at a higher intensity, higher VO2 max, higher FTP, whatever we want to measure, we're yep. actually letting carbohydrates just sit there until we need them at a certain intensity level. This is what yep. we don't know. We don't know if, if you're, and I'm not going to talk about the crazy diets like ketogenic, low carb, high fat, because that's definitely not, not our discussion topic today. But if you are depriving your body of carbohydrates in terms of, of, of diet, right? If you are doing a keto or a low carb, high fat diet, it makes it sense that you are decreasing your glycogen stores at the same time, right? And yes. that's why I'm yep. not a huge, huge fan of this unless we're periodizing it correctly in an athlete's training cycle. So back to your original question, if we become more metabolically efficient or fat adapted, you will preserve carbohydrate stores more efficiently. What we don't know is how many carbohydrate stores you have versus the athlete who is eating a high carb diet, who's burning carbohydrates like crazy. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay. So before we get into um, what a metabolic efficiency point is, mm -hmm. can we start by having you tell us uh, why it matters if we use carbs versus fat to mm -hmm. fuel our aerobic system? And I think we covered a little bit about that already, but yeah. is there anything else that you want to add to that? Yeah, I think it's, you know, I, 
I, I grew up not an endurance athlete, right? I grew up a competitive soccer player and have been doing in, endurance events, triathlon, cycling, ultra running, like all that for 25 years now, right? But here's the thing. When, when, I, when I learned this in university, it was all about putting in as many carbs into your diet as possible because it was, it was the whole high carb, low fat, right? Athletes need as many carbohydrates as possible. <laughs> What yeah. we were, and, and the only reason why, like the, when I first created this metabolic efficiency training concept in the early 2000s, you know, I, I went back to the research and, you know, metabolism and biochem and everything. And I remembered, you know, because, you know, sometimes you're in, you're in college and you're like, yeah, forget some of the stuff I learned. So, <laughs> I, you know, I, I dusted off my books and I'm like, oh, yeah, the body only stores between 1,200 to 2,000 calories as carbohydrate. And that, that depends on gender and uh, uh, muscle mass, so size, basically. So, so bigger guys will usually store more carbs. Smaller guys, smaller girls will usually store less carbs. So there's an issue here because we store, as, as we're not talking like elite cyclists, right? We're talking the, the more the recreational or highly competitive recreational cyclist. We can store 60, 80,000 or more calories as fat. So there's this huge issue here, this huge challenge and basically saying we store about as many carbohydrates to get us through about two to three hours of moderate intensity exercise. But from the fat standpoint, if we can actually tap into those fat stores, and, and we could talk about that a little bit later, we can, we can sustain, we could probably sustain 10 Leadville 100 bike races, right? It's crazy. It is. It's crazy. But, but here's the thing. Nobody knew how to tap into those stores because all the research in the 50s and 60s, 1950s, 1960s, was done based on exercise modalities. Nobody ever looked at the nutrition intervention of this. This is, this is where I come in. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So now that we know why it's important, we have obviously have a lot more fat to use to, yep. to fuel our bodies than we do that. Can you talk a little bit about what the metabolic efficiency point is? Because this is your mm -hmm. whole deal, really. Yep, exactly. So a little bit of quick physiology um, uh, primer. So in the 50s and 60s, there's this physiological concept called the crossover concept. So this is basically describing the relationship between fat burning and carbohydrate burning from zero intensity all the way up to 100% intensity. And it basically says this. You can pick up any ex-phys textbook and find the same thing that I'm talking about, is it says that ideally, which actually doesn't happen in, in more than 50% of the athletes that I've tested, ideally, you should be burning fat at lower intensities, so really up to about 60 to 65% of FTP or VO2 max. After okay. you go above 60 to 65%, your body shifts or crosses over into more carbohydrate burning. So that's the yep. traditional model. But like I just said, it was only based on exercise modalities and interventions. So what, what I did is I created, I actually added the nutrition part of it, called it metabolic efficiency because it's truly not the crossover concept anymore because we've added an intervention of, of diet essentially. So the metabolic efficiency point is the same, is the same thing I just explained. It's where your body crosses or that, that point actually happens between fat burning and carbohydrate burning or that switch. But metabolic yep. efficiency, it's very important to understand it is the combination of nutrition and exercise, whereas the crossover concept was only exercise driven. Okay. Yep. Okay. And I think what we'll do in the show notes of this, you, I think you've got some pretty good examples of this on your website. So what we can mm -hmm. do is link to your charts and you can see that certain athletes cross at different points. So the more fat, the more efficient you are at burning fat. Yeah. Let's say if you just start, you're, you're not very good at burning fat. You may start to, you know, burn carbs at 120 watts, but yeah. really efficient athletes can do it way up at 250, 260, or even higher. Absolutely. Um, so we'll get some links at, at in the show notes of this so that people can actually click on your charts and see it. Because when you see it visually, it's actually pretty shocking how much of a difference that it is. It brings it to life. Yeah. You really get yes. to understand it better. Yep. Perfect. So you use a metabolic efficiency test to mm -hmm. find someone's metabolic efficiency point. Mm -hmm. Can you describe that test for us? Yep. So when I first created this concept, 
I didn't really create the protocol. And so I'm, I'm a, a classically trained exercise physiologist in addition to a registered sport dietitian, right? So I actually okay. was a, you know, I went to school for physiology first and then went back to school for nutrition. So I actually, you know, I developed this concept, looked into the nutrition, guinea pigged it on myself with a few of my athletes, you know, changed their diets around <laughs> a little bit. It wasn't about a year after that until I, I said, I need to quantitatively prove this, right? I, I need to, you know, the athletes are feeling better. They're great. You know, everything's great, but if I can't prove this, right? So, so basically about a year later, I went back to exercise physiology 101, you know, put my hat on. I'm like, okay, I know how to, I know how to do VO2 max. I know how to do lactate testing. Can I devise a protocol that looks at this? And, and lo and behold, I did, right? It's called the metabolic efficiency test. It's a very simple, actually, if anyone has had a VO2 max test before, it is the exact opposite of a VO2 max test. So <laughs> yeah. it is, it is a submaximal test. It's actually, Besides putting the mask on your face, because we have to collect O2 and CO2 produced um, and, and consumed, besides that, it's actually a very comfortable test because it's it's submaximal. Uh, the stages are about five minutes in, in duration, and I never have gone to threshold unless an athlete asks to go or above threshold because I get the data. Because think about this, the, the metabolic efficiency test is a nutritional assessment. VO2 max and lactate test those are our physical assessments, physiological exactly. assessments, right? So it's, that's, it's night and day. It's actually enjoyable. Uh, it usually takes a little bit less time. It's usually about 30 minute test. Um, but, but here's to, to, to grossly, uh, depict how easy this is. Most male cyclists that I test will start out at about 80 to 100 watts. And depending on their level of competitiveness, we might increase between 20 to 50 watts every five minutes. It depends on if they're elite pro or more recreational, but think about, you know, spinning at 80 or hundred Watts. Like I have to start ridiculously low in this test because I don't want to yeah. miss this metabolic efficiency point because I learned my lesson early on. Cause I would always, you know, if you came to me and Chris, you're saying, Oh, Hey, my FTP is 250. I'd say, oh, okay, you know, we should start at hundred, but you'd talk me out of that. You'd say, no, 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 hundred's way too easy. And then I'd be like, oh, okay, let's start at 150. No, 150 is too easy. What I found early in this, in this game was that I missed the metabolic efficiency point because we were starting too hard. So uh, again, to kind of put this in, in context, this yeah. is the easiest test physiological test anyone will ever do from an intensity <laughs> standpoint. It's actually quite yeah. enjoyable. <laughs> and and with the common diet, so many people are such strong carb burners. Oh. They, you can, you've can you seen people burn. I mean, some people don't even have the crossover point, right? And, and that's kind of the next point we can talk about. So yeah. when you do the test, there are three different results that you have. You yep. have levels one, two, and three. So can you talk about those a little bit. Yep. So yeah, in, in someone, the athlete will always fall into one of those categories. There is nothing outside number or level one, two, or three. So level one okay. is just what you were saying. They're, they're most likely high carb, low fat, low protein. You know, that traditional carb loading diet, basically. Yep. They will never cross over. So they start out burning a super high amount of carbohydrate, hardly any fat. Their lines never meet. That is what I call level one. I, in, in my practice, and I've done thousands of these tests on athletes from, you know, mostly endurance athletes, cyclists, runners, triathletes, that's, that usually composes about 40%. 40% of athletes who I've tested. And it's pretty common. Even with my colleagues who do the testing, they see the same exact thing. And it's it, it, it's kind of sad if you think about it. Like their their daily nutrition, their diet is so far off that they're so inefficient in using their fat stores, right? So wow. no, no bueno, not a good thing, right? The the next probably 60 to 70% is that level two where they do have that what I call textbook cross. So they have a metabolic efficiency point. So they they start out burning more fat, lower car, less carbs, and at a certain wattage, they will cross. But here's what I find in almost every single one of the 60 to 70% of athletes I've tested, their, their crossover or their metabolic efficiency point is, is, a, is at a ridiculously low FTP or power output. Usually percentage of FTP. Percentage yeah. of FTP, exactly. And, and it, that's all over the board. But I will tell you that most individuals have a metabolic efficiency point. Most cyclists have a metabolic efficiency point 
less or lower than their lactate threshold. And my goal is to actually try to get the metabolic efficiency point closer, if not matched, or even above the lactate threshold point, if, if they have that data, because that's that's the economical part of increasing efficiency here. And and that's what Steve said in our last show. He said that in, in an ideal world, I said, what percentage of FTP can yeah. you get your crossover point to? Yep. And he said, 100. Absolutely. He wants it to be there, right? Yeah, so exactly. With, so it's basically, tough, but you, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but you don't start you don't start burning carbohydrates until you get to your FTP. So you've got a ton of reserves. You got a lot of matches, if you'll say, to exactly. burn. Exactly, a lot of matches. So you're not burning any matches on the way up. Okay. Right. So then the third type is is uh, that's the last pretty, one. Yeah, that's pretty extreme. So the level three is only about I'd say five, ten, fifteen percent at max. The level okay. three is basically I call this physical uh, fatigue. Basically saying this. They're burning so much fat, such a high level of fat and such a low amount of carbohydrate, they never cross. So this is the extreme AKA fat burner. But here's the thing. This is the cyclist who probably hasn't done a lot of anaerobic training. So they don't have the power in their legs to really push too much. So usually what I see is this is the, the cyclist who's been kind of toying with the ketogenic diet, toying with extreme low carb, high fat. But, but if you do that, I don't know if we're going to talk about that, but I'll talk about it right now. If you do that type of dietary influence on your body, you have very little chance of achieving a high FTP uh, in, in terms of doing intervals. Like there's no way you could do 150% FTP or above for your intervals because you just lack the carbohydrate or the glycogen stores to be able to, to get that oomph. See, and this is what Tim Noakes talked about on one of our episodes, and, yeah. and that was kind of a controversial episode because he said, you know, you don't really need to eat for an Ironman, you don't need, you know, which which is a thing. But in his defense, you can finish an Ironman on finish. that type of diet, Absolutely. but you're not going to win it, right? It's all and even, about competitiveness level, and that's what I always tell athletes. Yeah, so Depending on your level of competitiveness, then we have to kind of frame this discussion on carbs and protein and fat a little differently. Right. And even Team Sky has adopted a, a lower mm -hmm. carbohydrate diet. Yep. But around races, they're putting, they're ingesting more carbohydrates yep. to give them that competitive edge that they need to get through the races. So, yep. you, so you're seeing that with elite level guys. Yeah. They're periodizing their nutrition. And that's, I remember when that hit the, the press, everyone was blowing up. And I, like my email box was like lighting up. And they're like, oh my I gosh, imagine. what are they doing? I'm like, relax like they're periodizing their nutrition they they do that altering the nutrition or altering the carbohydrates a little bit you know not necessarily in their base training but they i know they did that but they'll they'll micro periodize their their nutrients so they're trying to get the best of both worlds because if you if you do lower your carbohydrate intake you're going to do you're going to you're going to signal different enzymatic reactions in your body that upregulate or downregulate carbohydrate metabolism so there's a time and a place for this but it has to be under the watchful eye of a sport dietitian, physiologist, someone who knows what they're doing. Cause like you said, once they got close to the race, I mean, they would, they would do so poorly if they didn't reintroduce carbohydrates at a certain level, it, it wouldn't even be funny. So again, yeah. you're talking about professional cyclists versus, you know, maybe, maybe the guy who's trying to do Leadville and just finish. Yeah. We're going to, we're going to toot different horns here for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's talk about how changing your metabolic efficiency point can affect how you fuel for races. And mm. I think this is my my big lesson at Leadville. So we've yeah. <laughs> spoken about this on the show before, but in endurance events, you are burning more calories per hour than your stomach can physically digest, or I think at least some people are. Yep. Can you talk about how improving your metabolic efficiency point changes how we fuel for races? Yep. So the the, the easiest kind of low-hanging fruit, if you will, way to explain this is, and we kind of opened with this also, if you teach your body to utilize more of its fat stores for energy, that means you'll be yep. preserving your carbohydrates, right? Where this yep. really kind of falls into play here is, and, and I've seen this, I've measured it. That's the whole purpose of metabolic efficiency testing, or at least one of the purposes is, say for example, a typical cyclist, male cyclist is putting down 300 calories per hour on the bike, right? Fairly yep. typical for the most part. It's usually 250 to 350 calories. We'll use 300 calories per hour. Now, if they're doing that, and again, a lot of factors, what if it depends, level of competitiveness, male, female, we get it, right? But if they're, if they're consuming 300 calories per hour and it's all coming from carbohydrates, 
and their FTP, their percent FTP is quite high, meaning it's over their metabolic efficiency point, which it probably yep. is, which we already talked about, they're going to be burning through their internal or carbohydrate stores, which are called glycogen stores, fairly yep. quickly. So they have to try to keep up. But here's the thing. This guy's, you know, if we're using a male, this guy's probably burning 900 to 1,000 calories during that hour also. So there comes a time where if you make your body more efficient using fat, you preserve carbohydrates, therefore you actually don't need as many supplemental carbohydrates during yep. the race or during training because you're actually relying more on your fat stores at a higher percentage of FTP. That is crucial, yeah. like a crucial point to, to take home. But here's, here's something I also wanted to mention because I, I kind of coined this term called the calorie intake efficiency ratio. And you can okay. see it on a couple of my slides on my, on my website, but it's exactly what you just said. Let's, let's go back to this guy. If this guy's burning a thousand calories an hour, there's no way he's consuming a thousand calories. There, there's, that physiologically is not possible during yeah. exercise, right? <laughs> Maybe if he was sitting on his couch or, you know, whatever, right? Um, yeah. but, but here's the thing. So I, I asked this question years and years and years ago. I was like, well, if, if we can't consume that, like how many can we consume? So I actually did a lot of anecdotal research, uh, basically asking cyclists who used power, uh, and heart rates. I asked them, you know, I, I took hundreds and hundreds of data samples from athletes that I knew, cyclists that I knew, and I basically compared what, you know, their kilojoules being burned versus their intake. So they would report to me how many calories they had per hour on different types of training ride, different FTP, everything. Basically, long story short, for cyclists, I came up with a calorie intake efficiency ratio, which basically means this is what you can put in your body in terms of calories per hour between 10 to 40% of what you're burning. Now, oh, runners wow. and triathletes, it's 10 to 30% because cyclists we know can eat a little bit more because usually not a lot of stomach issues. But so here's yep. the thing. If we can only eat up to 40% of what we're burning, uh, there's a little bit of an energy conundrum, right? So yeah, that's it's a war of attrition. <laughs> exactly. And that's, that's why this metabolic efficiency comes in so handy. So a, a grave example is this, you know, you may start out if, if you're a typical high carb, you know, low fat diet guy, you might start out needing to replace 40% of the calories you burn per hour on the bike. Right. But as we make you more metabolically efficient or fat adapted, that number decreases significantly and it usually decreases by about 50 to 75 percent i know that's a huge wow. number right but i can get someone down to like 10 to 20 percent of their calorie needs based on what they're burning and it's in in no lack of energy it's not like they're falling off their bike right it's just because they're burning fat at a higher percentage of ftp we don't need to introduce as many calories per hour. So we actually introduce them very strategically. So like looking at the Leadville course, we would, we would dissect that course and say, all right, if you're metabolically efficient and, you know, maybe you've had the testing and we know where that falls, this is where you need to consume, a, you know, a little bit higher amount of carbohydrates because either the altitude and or because the course dynamics, meaning climbs or descents. Or even a little nice. bit of flat, yeah. Okay. And that, that's going to help GI issues too, because oh, you don't have all those calories just sitting in your stomach. Exactly. So yeah, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Okay. So improving your fat burning ability has clear benefits for long distance athletes. Can shorter distance athletes gain uh, any performance benefits from burning more fat? Maybe like a one hour crit. Yeah. Here, here's the thing that I look at during the crit. Absolutely not. Well, I mean, crit is a little bit different. I mean, that's, you're so like, if you're doing anything nutritionally during that race, good luck, right? I mean, <laughs> I mean, you're not even drinking water, like take the cages off the bike. You're not doing anything, right? Um, yeah. But, but here's, here's where it benefits. Like for cyclists, we start talking about watts per kg, right? Power to weight ratio. And, yeah. and we, like I work with a lot of cyclists. So becoming more metabolically efficient, which is basically just manipulating your daily nutrition that will actually lead to some body weight, body composition changes. And if you're doing the training correctly with your coach, if you have a coach, that should be manipulating your power to weight ratio. So in fact, you're doing some back end work to improve your power for that crit or your power output output for that crit. It's not necessarily like for shorter distances, it's not necessarily about manipulating what you're putting in your body during that. It's what you're what you're doing for your body before that happens. 
Well, you might get to the start line cheaper, though, because if you're doing a lot of long-distance training Absolutely. to get to the crit, you don't have to buy all the food to eat on all your rides. Much cheaper. Much cheaper. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, in your books, you've mentioned that a lot of people overeat when training and racing. Uh, yep. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. You know, I refer it to as the you know, eyes are bigger than your stomach. So a lot of times, you know, and, and this is to kind of come back to the other concept that I've created, this nutrition periodization concept that actually came before metabolic efficiency. And it's basically, it basically states we, we as athletes, we need to align, we need to think about our nutrition in terms of our training cycle, right? So what I've seen is a lot of cyclists when they start their, their year, you know, usually January, depending on, on where they are, the type of racing they're doing, you know, if they start in January, it's their base training or prep cycle. They're doing some, some low or, you know, low volume, uh, trying to build it up low intensity. That's when I see a lot of cyclists overeating because they think, oh, I'm back in the saddle again, or I'm doing some, some indoor training or whatever, and I need to eat a lot. And, and in, in fact, the opposite is true. <laughs> so they're, they're not periodizing their energy expenditure or kilojoules, if you will, on their energy input or their daily nutrition. So okay. I see a huge, a huge mis mismatch in the early season. Then when they start, and this is the other big uh, snafu, when they actually start getting in some intensity or maybe early season races, they're absolutely over consuming on the bike most of the time. And that's, uh, honestly, it's just because they don't know, like you don't know what you don't know. Right. So they're, they're right. kind of going based off of, you know, the, the media, the press, they're not doing some physiological testing on themselves. You know, that's, that's where like when the rubber meets the road, you've, you've got to get some testing done on yourself. So you understand your body better. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Um, Another thing you mentioned too is as the intensity of the race increases, your stomach's ability to digest gets worse. And that's because oh, you're, you're losing blood at, in the stomach because it's going to the periphery muscles, right? Exactly. So can you talk a little bit about that and maybe give us some advice on how we can improve digestion during these higher intensity events? Yeah, it's well, and I would say this, you can't really improve the dynamics of digestion because it's going to happen. Like it's called blood shunting. So your blood yep. is going to be shunted from the gut to the working muscles, obviously the, the legs for cyclists. That's, that's where, and that's one of the beauties of metabolic efficiency, because if you can increase your fat burning, if you will, fat, ox fat oxidation, preserve carbohydrate, you don't have to introduce a lot of calories during a race or during high intensity training. It's the introduction of calories when the blood shunting is happening that completely destroys your, your gastric emptying and your digestive response. So even better, like if you can get away with not consuming 40% of the calories burned, but more 10 to 20%, your gut is going to be extremely happy. But here's the other thing. Remember what you talked about, um, with your nutrition for Leadville, you went from more of a whole food based. And then once you got in that, that challenging part, you went more towards the traditional sport nutrition product. A lot of times we have to think about the intensity of which we are cycling and what our body can actually process, meaning is it solid, semi-solid, or liquid sources of calories. So my mantra is whenever intensity goes up, certainly over your, your, over your, your metabolic efficiency points, if you know what that is, or close to your lactate threshold, you need to introduce more liquid calories so they can be assimilated better. That was definitely my lesson because I did yeah. a lot of my long six hour training rides at a little bit easier intensity than I raced Leadville. And yep. I think my stomach was able to digest at the easier intensity. But once I ramped it up, you know, 20 heart rate points, yep. uh, I was in trouble. Exactly. And <laughs> so. that's classic. A lot of cyclists do that. And I always, I call that race simulation training. So during training, at least one or two sessions, like take a chunk of it. Not that you're going to go out for a nine hour session and just hammer it. Right. But, but take like two or three hours of a longer ride and try a different nutrition strategy because the intensity should be race pace intensity or race pace FTP. Yep. And I did that, but I think it just wasn't long enough uh, for what I yeah, did. So yeah. anyway, I tried that, but uh, yeah, it wasn't successful. Yeah. So um, yeah. let's uh, let's talk a little bit about ch how we change the metabolic efficiency point. Mm -hmm. So you know we're, we we have this point. Let's say we're we're type two. We mm -hmm. get on the bike. We actually do have a, a crossover point, or maybe yep. we're one. We don't have a crossover point. Yep. And we notice that basically throwing our leg over the bike has us burning carbohydrates, right? Yeah. So we're low on that. <laughs> we're not. We're nowhere near FTP, and we're burning carbs. Yeah. 
So let's talk about how we improve that. Uh, let's start with exercise. Now, we just had Steve on uh, our last show, and he he kind of went over a much more detailed discussion on how you can use that with exercise. So yep. we won't get too much into detail with that because I really want to focus on nutrition with you. Yep. But can you just give us your high-level thoughts on exercise and how you can change it with uh, MEP with, with exercise. Yeah. It's, it's funny. Cause you know, I'm, I'm also a coach, right? So we do a lot of zone training, a lot of zone terminology. I'll tell yep. you this though, in all the metabolic efficiency tests I've done versus like field testing too, you, you really don't know metabolically what zones you should be in until you have it tested via a metabolic cart. So, so field testing won't do it. Lactate threshold won't do it. Like you've got to have a metabolic efficiency test done. And this is why I'm, I'm opening with this is because what I have found is most cyclists actually end up training at too high of intensity. So they yes. cannot utilize that 25% uh, contribution from, from aerobic exercise. So when in, like if I've got that metabolic efficiency point, I can pick, you know, to the left of that, if you, if you can envision this to the left of that is where your body's burning more fat. So say your metabolic efficiency point happens at 200 Watts, right? Yep. Under 200 Watts, your body is burning more fat. So the, the 30,000 foot views to say, ah, oh, Chris, just train it under 200 Watts. But somewhere on that curve, there's going to be one or two sweet spots that are maximizing your fat adaptation exercise wattage. So higher level is, if you know where your MEP is, metabolic efficiency point, you know, train under that, but there's always one or two points that are going to give you more bang for your buck. And that's what we see from the testing. We can pick that out quite, quite easily. How do you pick that out? What are you seeing? You basically look at, so if you were to kind of dissect a test and look at like the data I even give athletes is we can look from stage to stage. We can look at the increase in not only total calories, which is not necessarily what we're looking at. We look at the increase in the calories coming from carb or fat. Then we look at basically the delta between each stages and we can really pinpoint where the biggest bang for their buck is. So you know, as an example, maybe they're burning 400 calories in stage one and 500 calories in stage two, but, and I'm going to totally get this wrong because I'm totally just coming up with this, but maybe yeah, those, yeah, yeah, maybe yeah. those calories in stage one, you know, 300 of them are coming from carb and 100 from fat. And then the next stage it's, you know, 400 from carbs and 100 from fat. Like there's somewhere in there, there's going to be a very big split and carbohydrates will shoot up significantly and fat calories will go down significantly. So we basically are trying to find right before that happens. And, and the, the great thing about data, and I know you love data, the great thing about yeah. it is we can see it when it's happening. Like that's the beauty of having numbers is we can actually identify it. We, we can take the guesswork out of it. So no more asking the athlete, oh, how do you feel? Like that's still important. Don't get me wrong. But having numbers just solidifies this whole thing. So okay, on perfect. this example, maybe it's not, you know, 200 Watts. Maybe I found, oh, Chris, you know, your ideal is 150 Watts. And even though you're burning fat up to 200 Watts, burning more fat, 150 is your sweet spot. That's where you should spend when you have your longer training days in the saddle. That's what you should try to hit. Okay. Yep. Okay. And anything for over that? Like, are you doing any tempo work or does that improve it as well from your point tempo of view? Work, it, it actually, from a, from a physiological standpoint, anything that goes above aerobic contributions will not facilitate the contribution of, of increasing fat oxidation. Um, okay. you're still burning calories, but most of those calories are now coming from carbohydrate. Once, once you pass over that metabolic efficiency point. Okay. Perfect. All right, let's get into changing metabolic efficiency point with nutrition, mm -hmm. which is definitely your your strength. So, yep. uh, so let's again let's assume that the athlete has some room for improvement. Yep. What and I think we've we've covered this. It's base, but what is the most common dietary problem that an athlete has? Is it that they're just eating far too many carbohydrates? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's that um, for you the ratio. Uh, it, it is the ratio, but it is, it's in, in, it's still happening. It's to a lesser degree because these cra crazy diets are popping up, but it is because we live in such a high carbohydrate dominant society. And I'm talking the United States of America. For some reason, cyclists think that it's all about carbs and the paradigm shift I'm trying to give is it's not all about carbs. It's about periodizing your carbohydrates protein and fat. So it's, it's about looking at carbs and saying like, here's, here's a very, very easy way to explain this. That really catches people off guard. Um, if any of your listeners eat cereal in the morning or throughout the day, right? Here's how I explain it. 
the way we are brought up in the United States is when we eat cereal, we get a bowl, we grab the cereal, put the cereal in the bowl, and then we put milk in and then we eat it, right? Well, yeah. that's the paradigm that I've been trying to change the past 20 plus years. So I know it sounds very, very strange, but the way I teach it is you put the milk in first because that is your protein and fat source, right? A little bit of carbohydrate, of course, too, but that is actually more balanced with with nutrients, which we'll get into here in a second, right? Then you put the cereal in. That's one way to actually express the dynamics of changing your behavioral approach to nutrition. So pasta, another great example, right? Cyclists are still doing this or pasta loading before some stage races, right? Instead of getting putting pasta on your plate first, put if if you're not a vegan or vegetarian, put meat on your plate first. So put you know if you're at a party or par pasta party or whatever, if they have chicken or steak or meatballs or sausage, put that on your plate first, then put the pasta on because for some reason cyclists are just forgetting about protein and fat, and that's yeah. that's the underlying issue here. It's not, you know, don't go, keto. like, you don't have to go keto. You have to go low carb, high fat. I mean, if you want to, you know, go for it. I mean, that's up to you. That's your choice. But really, we just need to be more sensible in, in periodizing our, not only our, our ratio of, of, of macronutrients, but also we need to assume and remember that this is a behavior change. It's not about getting on the bike and getting off the bike. It's about we're facing our nutrition demons, if you will. And a lot of it is based <laughs> on how you grew up. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so we're going to talk about ratios in a little bit, but yep. what's the, you know for the people who well, let's talk about the ratios. What is kind of the ideal ratio mm -hmm. of protein to carbs and fat? Yep. Or you know, I know you talk a lot about the protein carb ratio. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about that and what what is ideal and where most people are. Yep. So I, I won't, uh, I'll spare you with the, the details of the background of all this, but please know and, and for your listeners too that I didn't make. I didn't make this up. I created it, yes, but it's all created on science. So when I talk okay. about these ratios, it actually comes from diabetes research. So people with diabetes and looking at optimizing blood sugar control, because that's with metabolic efficiency, the nutrition impl implication here is really about finding the ratio of carbohydrate, protein, and fat, being able to optimize your blood sugar in terms of not not uh, liberating the insulin release from the pancreas too much too often because that is actually what deters us from in from fat oxidation so there's a whole bunch of science behind this i'm gonna i'm gonna kind of you know not get into that unless you really want me to and i'd love to but um the the ratios exist to help people on a simple level simple qualitative level so I'm not going to poo poo the, the athletes who count calories, count grams, carb, protein, and fat. That's fine. If that's what you want to do, you can do it. I usually don't try to promote it because there are more underlying issues we need to look at first, like intuitive eating, satiety, maybe getting over some, like I call those nutrition demons of how you grew up with food. But basically, the ideal ratio of carbohydrate to protein is a one to one ratio. That in research, diabetes research, optimizes blood sugar the highest level that you can now i probably should introduce really what i'm talking about here right so i use what i call a hand model right one okay. hand is carbohydrate one hand is protein the now the reason why i do this and, and we can do this is technically speaking one gram of carbohydrate has the same amount of calories as one gram of protein Tet I mean, yep. for all, all inducive purposes, right? So why don't we talk about fat? Well, if you are not a vegan or a vegetarian, mostly a vegan cyclist, the fat that you are consuming is found in your animal protein sources. So we don't have to necessarily worry about fat. And here's a lot of your listeners are probably thinking, oh, is he going to talk about keto or low carb, high fat? No, I'm not because that's not metabolic efficiency. Right, metabolic efficiency training is actually periodizing your macronutrients to support health and performance related goals. It's not necessarily following a diet, like this is a lifestyle, but you're periodizing. And that's the hard part for a lot of cyclists is, is they have to actually increase and decrease their macros. But if it just comes down to this hand model, this ratio, one to one, one handful of carb, one handful of protein. I know you as an engineer, because I've worked with a lot of engineers, it drives them crazy because there are no <laughs> numbers, right? But that's the point, right? That's the point is kind of going qualitative, subjective, getting away from numbers for a few, and just connecting with how 
how nutrition feels in their body. Okay. Yeah. This is great. Now, there, I, <laughs> I'm going to go off the topic a little bit here because yeah. sit, I like to experiment with most of the things that we do on the show. So, I personally have been trying this diet. So, we're going we're gonna to divert a few things here. But let's yeah. start with my... I've been doing it for, I don't know, a week and a half, two weeks. So, let me talk about my experience a little bit. Um, and then I think what that may do is help fill in some of the problems that maybe people experiencing the diet or experimenting with the diet may have. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I am an engineer, so I totally get the hand model. It's simple. Um, the first question I have for you about the hand model mm -hmm. is, does it matter what the carbohydrate source is? So if you have uh, brown rice and vegetables yes. or just vegetables or white rice versus brown rice, yes. etc. So yes and no. Um, from a quality perspective, nutrient density perspective, Absolutely. We, we yes. like, well, there's also, and it depends if, if a cyclist has a weight loss goal, we try to reduce the starchy carbohydrates and really the vegetables, right? So, so we try to reduce sweet potatoes and we try to reduce corn and peas and try to get more of the nutrient dense, but lower calorie veggies in there. But when it comes to like what you were saying with brown rice or, you know, that kind of thing, qualitatively, no. Quantitatively, okay. no, because you're still like you still have that one gram of of uh, carbohydrate as for roughly four calories versus the the protein. So yes and no. There's it gets a little bit deeper than that, but I think for what you're introducing, no, that's fine. No, okay, okay. So second question: If you have more protein than carbohydrates, is that bad? Let's say you have a two to one protein to mm -hmm. carb ratio. Is that bad? My first question to you would be, what is your training cycle, right? So here comes that nutrition periodization. So I'm assuming because it was post Leadville that that was during recovery or what I call transition cycle, right? Uh, I actually started when I started training again. So I'm back right. in a base phase. Okay. Base phase. Okay. Yep. Perfect. So I would say based on that and based on my assumption of your energy expenditure and your training during base training, I would say that's totally fine. As long as you feel like you're meeting your energy needs, which again, I'm making the assumption that probably most of your rides right now are zone one, zone two, maybe a splash of tempo every so often, right? But that- Yeah, that, tempo maybe once, twice a week. Yeah. So that as long as, and, and here's the thing, like as long as your training sessions aren't longer than two or three hours, you're, you're totally fine. Absolutely. And in fact, here's another, you know, monkey wrench. If you actually wanted to change your body comp or maybe, you know, manipulate your body weight, that's actually a pretty darn good ratio. And this is the ideal time of the year before you start adding a lot of intensity. Cause once you start adding intensity, you need to kind of facilitate more of that one to one ratio carb to protein. And then when you're in the heat of training, you can, what, which I didn't, um, I didn't discuss earlier. You can actually go up to a two to one ratio carb to protein and still control your blood sugar quite well. So I do what's called a microcycle periodization with some athletes and I'll pick apart their week. So say, you know, t say for example, you're the typical age group cyclist, you stack your Saturday and Sunday, right? So we know it's long volume or high volume, uh, maybe some intensity in there. And, and those are the days where I actually might give you a two to one ratio. Whereas maybe the Monday through Friday, after I understand your training modalities, maybe that's more of a one to one ratio. So okay. yeah. So you can still improve body weight and composition on a one to one, right? You don't oh, need the huge, huge, absolutely. Okay, okay, absolutely. Cool. Okay, yeah. Okay, so I am an engineer, so I did. I got uh, one of the apps on my phone and looked at yep. everything because I just I really wanted to understand this so that I could explain it to listeners or anyone who asks me. So I took a typical day and uh, of what I ate before I started this diet, if you will, eating lifestyle, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And I was um, 50% carbs, 15% protein, 35% fat. So, it was a three to one ratio or a little bit more of uh, carbs to protein. Mm -hmm. So, I started by trying to go to a 30, 30, 40. So, 30% 30 carbs, mm -hmm. uh, protein, carbs, fat. Okay. okay. The first thing that I noticed, the first few days of it is I was starving. Yep. Like the entire day long, I couldn't, all I could think about was food. And I had uh, a three hour ride. Um, I burned 2000 calories on it. I ate 4,500 calories that day, mm -hmm. but I was literally starving all day long. So, but now that it's been a week, I guess the hunger is 
really not there anymore. Mm -hmm. So even on short rides in the beginning, like an hour and a half easy ride, 30 minutes in, I was like eating my arm. So is that the adaptation? Is that my body starting to switch? Because now I'm not experiencing that. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, so let me preface this by saying there's absolutely a difference between not only gender, but there's also a genetic influence there that, that is just starting to be known. Um, there aren't many, uh, implications or even, uh, any data we can, we can strongly associate with that yet, but it's, it's starting to be, be studied a little bit. That said, we know there's at least a three to seven day nutritional adaptation change, mostly because if you think about it from a simplistic uh, way of, of looking at it from, from entry to exit, which basically means digestion process, right? When you introduce yep. a food to your body until the time it does its thing and exits finally, that could be two to three days. So when you're talking like it's like nutrition, this is why nutrition takes a lot longer to change than does training. Like you can hop on and off your bike pretty quickly, right? Or get your right. session done in your, in your finish for the day. But nutrition, there's usually that three to seven day adaptation phase in the keto world. I've, I've got a good finger on the pulse in the keto world because, you know, I, I usually end up dispelling a lot of that stuff for athletes. But in, with, in the keto world where you're like significantly depleting your body of carbohydrate, that could be six to 12 months as an adaptation. Wow. But from what you okay. do, usually I give to, to, as a buffer, I do a seven to 10 day adaptation process. So within those days, I actually don't like your training to be that focused. I like it to be a lot of zone one, zone two, not yep. that long because I know that's going to happen. And it, and it does okay, with so every single person. Getting super hungry is normal. You know, it, it, what usually ends up happening when you have these macronutrient shifts is you just end up under eating the nutrients that actually make you fuller longer and that's protein and fat. And so, but if you, if you kind of stayed on that, those percentages, then yes, it's truly the adaptation process, but there might be a time where you, you, you know, and I don't know, cause I didn't, I haven't seen the numbers, but based on what you said, it, it there might be a time where you just underfed calories. It, it, it could okay. happen. Yeah. Okay. So here's my next question. I like I'm on my big day. I ate 4,500 calories just to break even, mm -hmm. right? Because I'm not really trying to lose weight. I'm, I'm kind of where I want to be. Mm -hmm. In order to do that with a 30, 30, 40 ratio, I had to eat 250 grams of protein, mm -hmm. but I only weigh 150, 55 pounds. So that's probably too much protein. Is that correct? Uh, let me do some quick math here. Cause the, it's, it's definitely the, on the higher end. So that's, you know, I, I, I think metrically, cause that's what a lot of the research is, is done in. So usually for protein, uh, endurance athletes, endurance cyclists should, we could consume about 1.2 to about 2.5 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. What you just okay. reported was about 3.5 grams. It's not ridiculously high. Like I've still seen studies in the 3.5 to 4 grams per kg. It's, it's okay. definitely high. Don't get me wrong. Um, but that's where I would have probably dropped your protein and introduced more fat. And that's okay, and probably that was my question. Why, yeah. That was my question. So on, on these big days where I need to eat four or 5,000 calories, yep. your recommendation would be to keep the protein and carbohydrates more in that uh, 1.2 to 2.0 grams per kilogram. And if I protein, need the yes. additional calories, yep. yes. Yeah. If I need the additional calories, add it in fat. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And you can push okay. your protein a little bit higher. Like I said, maybe 2.5 grams per kg. Um, carbohydrates is going to be a little bit of a moving target depending on what you're eating on the bike. Um, but, but yeah, fat should be the makeup of those calories in, in your experiment for sure, because that's, okay. that's probably why you're getting so hungry or why you were getting so hungry. Okay. And what are some good sources for that? I mean, you can't just drink olive oil by the cup. I know. So like <laughs> Although I've had athletes do that. Coconut oil. They were like downing coconut oil. I'm like, oh, that's disgusting. <laughs> really? Yeah, I know. <laughs> okay. So what, what would your, like as an advice, if I just need to get a lot more calories with fat, what's a good food source that you use for that? To be honest with you, nuts, as long as you don't have any allergies, nuts are a no, huge okay. bang for your buck because they're so calorie dense and they're predominantly more fat than they are carb or protein. They are. Yeah. Easy, easy, like nut butter packets, you know, nuts in general, that is like an easy go-to. Um, if you're, if you're talking about quick and easy, 
Um, you know, obviously any, any animal proteins, well, almost all animal protein sources will have fats. You talk about meats, you talk about cheeses. So it kind of depends on when you're talking about crafting it during the day. Like, do you want to just add some to your lunch or, you know, do you want to have like a snack or if you're just trying to add total calories that are more fat based, then that would absolutely be, you know, nuts would, would be my top choice for sure. If you don't want to guzzle some oil. Yeah, yeah, and you can do whole fat uh, cheeses uh, and, and oh, cottage cheese. Yeah, you cheese has should been my be friend. doing. Yeah, you yeah. should. And, and just so your listeners understand this, if you're eating like yogurt or cheese or cottage cheese fat. or any whole, like full on, like go for it. Don't don't skim there. Okay, perfect. Yeah. All right. Before we get into your your models, which are brilliant, mm-hmm. I, we can talk about that in a minute. But I, I do want to go back to one point that you made about blood blood sugar control. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of talk lately about how uh, controlling your blood sugar is, well, we all know that it is uh, connected to type 2 diabetes, Mm -hmm. right? And my general understanding is, let's say you take a tablespoon of of, uh, just table sugar, Mm -hmm. okay? You eat it. The sugar is not necessarily bad, but what is bad is the sugar causes a increase in your blood glucose level. Yep. Your body responds by having your pancreas secrete insulin, which controls that blood sugar rise Um, the problem with that is if you eat a diet high in sugar for a long time, you exhaust the pancreas and eventually the cells in your body become, um, unresponsive, if you will, to insulin, right? Insulin resistance. That's how type two, insulin resistance. Yep. Now there's a new, there's new talk about type three diabetes Mm -hmm. where you have insulin resistance to the neurons in the brain, which is linked to Alzheimer's disease. Same effect, right? Yep. Okay. So my question is this. Let's say you cut table sugar out of your diet 100%, but you're eating a diet that is four to one carbs to protein. Yep. You're still getting the blood sugar increase because of that carb to protein ratio. You're you still go. getting the insulin response. Are you still susceptible or putting yourself at a higher risk for these type 2 and type 3 diabetes as well? 98% yes. The only 2% okay. that could be argued is if those are super high fiber carbohydrates and fiber is usually somewhat indigestible in the in the colon digestive tract. So that usually doesn't like we when 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 I counsel athletes I say, you know, with your carbohydrate sources you got to have high fiber because it 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 helps all these processes. Number 1, it helps actually control the blood sugar response. So Okay. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up because this you know, athletes, individuals, anybody, they need to really be aware of this type three. Um, they really do because it is it is rampant right now. And I predict in the next five to 10 years, it's just going to be ridiculous. Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so when you say high fiber sources, like if you go, if you have a hamburger with a bun, the bun's not a high fiber source, right? Um, it's really nachos. hard. They're yeah. not a high, right? No. Like none of that stuff counts, does exactly. it? Exactly. And, and let's, well, let's talk about that. Like most people, like when I ever give my little presentations to athletes and, you know, I just talk about, oh, hey, what, what are high fiber foods? And they're like, oh, fruits and veggies. I'm like, yeah, that's, it's good, right? Don't get me wrong. It's good. But like whole grains, and that's what you're getting to, whole grains are not necessarily are, are the breads and the rices and the pastas you're seeing in the grocery store. Like whole grains are these foreign terms that nobody knows about. Things like triticale and bulgur and sorghum. And they're like, what is that? And like, that's whole grain. Like the closer we can get to those whole grain sources, the higher fiber we have, unfortunately, because we live in, in our world. Um, we are, we are so, so inundated with processed and refined carbohydrates that have very little fiber and actually contribute to quite a high blood sugar rise for most of the time. Okay. So is barley a better example? Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Barley, farro. Yep. Absolutely. Awesome. Okay. That's great. That's been a topic of discussion. My brother and I have been talking about it. My brother talks about it a lot. So I just kind of wanted to cover that one because I think a lot of people don't understand that. They're like, well, I'm not eating sugar, but exactly. So, but there's still, you could still affect your blood sugar, even if you're not eating sugar. Absolutely. And it is, it's all about the ratio, like you mentioned. Exactly. Okay. Um, We've talked about the hand model. Uh, mm-hmm. You also you, there, you have five or six different ones. We're not going to get into all those because some of them are more d- uh, difficult. Yeah. But uh, and and read his book. Uh, honestly, your books are incredible. I've read all three of them. You, you have more than three, but I've read them. We'll get into that later. But um, you also have something called periodized periodization plates. We'll yeah. Talk about that a little bit. That's more of a visual model that I really you know I I kind of 
put that into my nutrition periodization, you know, explanation basically. But, but it, it, it's more of a, vi like a lot of people I found are visual learners. So I put it on a, as a plate example. So basically you look at the plate you eat on and you're, you're in very simplistic terms, you're manipulating the proportions of whole grains, protein and fat, and then the color rich foods, which are fruits and veggies. And based on the periodization or training cycle that you're in, uh, for, for like yourself, great, great, great example, you would actually reduce the whole grains, um, have the fruits and veggies be very moderate, and then you would try to maximize the protein and fat right now because of the training cycle you're in. The energy expenditure simply does not necessitate a high energy intake, especially from carbohydrates. But then, you know, give it however many months you're, you know, until you get into your more your intense phase, then th that the proportions on that plate shift. So now maybe you're introducing more fruits and veggies, and maybe you're introducing a little bit more whole grains while your protein and fat go down slightly. So that's okay. the periodization plates is basically a, a, a real time uh, depiction of how food is put on your plate, but it's all based on your energy expenditure needs of your training cycle. Perfect. Okay. Now for the numbers geeks, I know you're not huge on numbers, but yep. for guys like me, I think we've covered this, but is it safe to say that as long as you get your protein requirement for the day, try and match that with carbohydrates and fill in the rest with fat? I think that's a really good explanation of it because you simply cannot overeat protein. You'll get so full so quickly, so easily that it's really hard to overdo it without getting sick. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Uh, can you give us your best advice for training or for timing meals around training at different times of the day? So let's say you you're a morning workout guy, mm -hmm. or you're the guy who does your workout right after work at five o'clock. Yeah. How do you time meals around that? So a lot of it kind of depends on two or three questions beforehand. One is uh, what training cycle are you in? The other is what is your objective for that training session? So say the, say the athlete wakes up at oh dark 30, they, they hop on their trainer, it's still dark outside, maybe they're just doing some aerobic foundation work, zone one, zone two. I would tell that athlete, hey, if you wake up and you're not hungry, just hop on the bike, grab some water, start hydrating, and then eat breakfast right after. Contrast that to someone who wakes up at oh dark 30 and says, oh, my coach has me doing this 90 minute tough interval session, you know, maybe it's a FTP boosting session. Then I would say, all right, that's a very important workout, meaning performance enhancing. You need some type of calories beforehand, and beforehand should probably be 45 to 90 minutes before. So it kind of sucks, right? Because they have to wake up a little bit earlier. Um, what usually ends up happening <laughs> is these athletes try to structure and say, oh, I'm not going to wake up earlier. Maybe I'll shift that important training session to later in the day when I'm more nourished. So a lot of it does depend on on what you're trying to accomplish, the training cycle you're in. And then obviously, like if it's a later in the day session, it, it really like a lot like if I don't if I don't know the answers to the questions I just posed, there's no way I can answer your question. Right. Because if someone says, oh, hey, I'm going to go out for a ride after work at six o'clock and I'm going to go a couple hours. I still need to know what training cycle you're in and what your goal for that workout is. You know, if you're going to if you're going to be pushing tempo or a zone four threshold and above, then all right, we're going to introduce some type of 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 decent snack at probably four thirty, you know, four to four thirty ish to get you enough energy to be able to hit the power numbers you want. But so it, and maybe at a, a two to one ratio instead of a one to one. Exactly. Ratio. Exactly. Yeah. So now you're understanding that microcycle periodization a little bit more. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. So if maybe as a general, I mean, this can't, I'm not going to make you, you know, write this down as gospel, but yeah. if it's more of an aerobic easy ride, a one to one yep. ratio to fuel yourself, if yep. it's a harder threshold ride, a two to one ratio might be wiser. That'd be a good way to explain it for sure. Yep. Okay. Um, some you hear a lot of people talking about fasted training or yeah. starvation training. Yeah. They wake up in the morning and instead of doing a one to two hour ride, they're doing a three, four, five hour ride, yeah. but no food. What are yeah. your thoughts on this? You know, there's scientific proof that fasted training will upregulate some processes at the mitochondrial level to improve fat burning. So absolutely, 100%, we know that is valid. However, it can also negatively affect hormonal status in males and females. Males, obviously, a little more testosterone-based. Females, I've seen a little bit more thyroid-based. So people, like I'm okay with, hey, you wake up every so often and maybe once a week, maybe even twice a week, and you're not hungry and you want to do a longer ride and you want to do it fasted. All right, that's like fine. That's totally fine. 
but if it's strategically placed and too often, that's when I start seeing some pretty negative effects in terms of the hormonal responses. Okay, yeah. perfect. Um, let's talk about um, fueling while training. Mm. Let's go, let's go with training, and then maybe we can talk about racing. I think mm -hmm. racing is just a higher intensity, so yeah. maybe a little bit more calories. But let's say you've got a a long weekend ride, four hours or something like that, versus a maybe one and a half to two hour training ride. Um, that's a little. So let's do an easy intensity long ride versus a, a harder intensity shorter ride. Mm -hmm. What are you having athletes eat during those rides? Well, it depends on what they want to do from a nutrition stand, like metabolic efficiency standpoint, right? So I would love for them on that easy longer ride, I would love for them to wake up, uh, have, you know, if it's a weekend ride, right, have a sensible breakfast that is more like that one to one ratio, put, put a little, put a little fuel in their tank. And then depending you know a lot on on terrain obviously if it's not too hilly um if they could just strategically use a very low amount of of fuel during that ride meaning like i would say something around the nature of you know 50 calories every hour and a half or so just enough to to kind of prime that pump so you got to remember like one of the basic premises of those type of rides is to not only improve your aerobic energy system, but it's to also to improve your fat adaptation response, right? So the Correct. more, the more carbohydrate you put in your system before and during the less fat adaptation response you're going to have. So I don't usually like to have them go, you know, four hours with no calories unless they can do it. And I've, I've actually trained some, some athletes who do that quite frequently. I don't want them to do that in the beginning because they haven't prepared themselves, but, um, it, it's, I will tell you after, like after your adaptation phase, you could start experimenting with that and just having water and maybe, you know, a little splash of, of electrolytes if you need them, which I doubt you would based on that, that training cycle or that goal of that ride. So that's, it's, it's okay. not necessarily about starvation training. It's just about getting the fuel that you actually need for that training session. Okay, so now that we're on the long topic, so let's say now you're doing a four hour, five hour, you know, uh, Grand Fondo, you're mm -hmm. racing hard. Yep. How are you fueling them then? Well, that's where carbohydrates come in really, really handy. Like if the performance level is high, level of competitiveness for them is like super high, like they want to do well, they yep. absolutely need carbohydrates. But, but here's the thing I can't answer at what frequencies, right? In in what amounts because we don't know the efficiency of that athlete. Maybe it's maybe that Until athlete you test them. Exactly. Maybe they're more metabolically efficient so they only need 50 calories of from carbohydrate per hour or maybe they're metabolically inefficient so they need 300 calories per hour. But we know this, the frequency of carbohydrate delivery must be scheduled. The quantity is somewhat unknown until we know either they're tested or we can kind of ask some questions like, you know, what, what have you done in past rides? What have, you know, what kind of calories are you consuming? So you can kind of extrapolate it based on some Q and a, but it's better just to have the test done. What's your frequency that you like in those races? Like uh, you know, if you're using simple sugar based products, uh, you have to dose about every 30 to 45 minutes. If you're not okay. doing simple sugar, you can go more like 75 to 90 minutes, which is obviously my preference personally. Okay, yeah. perfect. Um, so after exercise, uh, people often eat carbohydrates right away to replenish their, their glycogen stores. You don't like this idea. Can just, you explain why? I just love it. I, I love this because it's unfortunately that, that media has not... Well, probably media doesn't know either. Here, here's the thing. Let me open it up with this. In science, yep. here's what we know. This is hardcore science. It's proven research. We can actually restore glycogen stores within 16 to 24 hours post hard ride or hard race, just on your normal daily diet, which means this. If you don't have an important session in the next day after you get off that bike, you don't need to rush any time in, in getting carbs into your body immediately after a session or a race. You, you, you simply don't need to. In fact, if the goal is more weight, body composition focused, you probably should not introduce a lot of carbs post-race or post-hard training session because all that does is it actually blunts the fat burning response. But but here's the other thing. Like you look at the tour riders, right? What What's happening? Well, they've got to bounce back every single day. Yeah. They need to shove the carbohydrates in their body after they get off the bike. So, you know, if, if you're, you know, if one of your listeners is like, you know what? Yeah, I'm doing doubles or, you know, I've, if I've got multiple stage races or whatever that, that happen within that 24-hour window, 
yeah, you better be introducing a pretty good amount of carbohydrate immediately. And, and that's within that 30 to 60 minute window when you get out of the saddle. And what ratio would you have them eat then? Usually Higher? I do like a three to one, maybe a four to one. If they want maximum, like quick glycogen reabsorption, we're talking like four to one ratio of carb to protein. Okay. And that's not enough to get you out of fat adaptation. That's just... It won't knock you out. It'll it'll significantly lessen, but it won't completely knock you out. Okay. Yeah. Um, so since we're on that topic, what are you? what's your thoughts on um, carb carb loading before a race like can you oh, yeah. change how you eat a few days before or a few days or weeks before a race to gain all these benefits i you hear some of these guys who will literally eat like thousands and thousands of calories of carbohydrates before a race yeah. for is does that work well so i'll tell you past research like when i grew up uh, in university at least we knew that a five to six day uh, carbohydrate loading regimen was the thing, right? That that was good. It increased glycogen levels. What they've come to find, and this is this is probably 10, 15 year old data now, is that we can actually accomplish the same thing within 24 to 36 hours. So it's great news because you don't have to feel like you're gorging yourself for a week. But but here's the <laughs> thing. This is what I always tell people. If you're following a high carb, low fat diet, you better be eating carbohydrate like they're going out of style before a race because when you eat more carbs in your diet, you're burning more carbs, which means you're always in a deficit, right? But in contrast, if you're more metabolically efficient, you know, sparing your carbohydrate store, storing them a little bit more, all you need to do within that 24 to 36 hours pre-race is just add a few more servings of carbohydrates. So a little bit more, usually I go fruits uh, with athletes, just, you know, maybe three or four more servings a day in a day and a half leading up to a race. That's really all it takes. Cause think about this, if you're metabolically efficient and you consume, you know, a thousand grams of carbohydrates more than you're used to, you're gonna actually start to change your oxidation rate of carb to fat. You, it, It'll be very tough to change that within 24 hours, but you can start to facilitate that change. And that's the last thing you want to do if you've spent all that time trying to be efficient. Yeah. So if you're if you're doing like a one-to-one -one primarily, maybe yep. the day before a race, would it make sense to do a two-to-one? Two-to-one would be before? perfect. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's actually okay. what I end up doing with athletes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Um, does having a better diet like this, this one-to-one -one ratio, this, this balanced diet, does that also allow our bodies to adapt better to the training we, we give it? Mm, go a little bit more with that question. I don't know if I understand that fully. Um, okay. So by eating a better diet, yeah. when Be better we- Better meaning defined as more metabolically efficient or- More better about, no, more better about metabolically efficient, okay. right? So okay. we're, we're getting a better ratio of carbohydrates. We've, we've changed our diet. We've improved our diet. And then we go out and we do our tempo rides and our endurance rides. Does our body, since we're feeding it be a better diet, does it- respond and adapt better to the training that we do because we have a better nutritional strategy behind it? Hmm. I don't think there's an easy answer to that. What I'm thinking is uh, like, like from the standpoint of I'm thinking different markers, right? So, so can we, can we impact the inflammatory markers better, which would, which would therefore produce better training adaptations? Absolutely. Hands down. Um, can you, can you, uh, uh, improve the body's ability to utilize and store glycogen and fat better, which would eventually, you know, I, I don't think it's a direct correlation. I think it's more indirect. Um, but I guess the simple answer is yes, but I think it's probably not in the way you're asking. I think it's more at the cellular level, really okay. based on the inflammatory responses. Okay. We've talked a little bit about the benefits of this diet. It helps uh, reduce uh, types of diabetes, the type three, the type uh, two. Mm -hmm. We've also talked about improving your, your, uh, your weight and your body composition. Are there yep. any other health improvements that you oh, see with this? Oh, a ton. I mean, aside from body weight, body composition, everything you mentioned, uh, blood lipids is a big one. Um, so we're talking about triglyceride and more of the in-depth factors of cholesterol, like the particle size of LDL, particle size of HDL. Those can be impacted greatly when you control your blood sugar better. Uh, there, there are a lot of links to inflammation, to obviously, ob like a lot of the health markers, obesity, inflammation, um, other certain diseases like any inflammatory disorder, such as uh, IBS uh, or even uh, like rheumatoid arthritis. So there, there are actually a lot of spinoffs from the health side of things, not just the athletic side of things in terms of trying to optimize and regulate your blood sugar better. So tendonitis would be one of those as tendonitis, well. Tendonitis, absolutely. Any type of inflammatory. Okay. Yep. 
So not only does this help you be a better athlete, it also just helps you be a healthier human being in the process. Well, and as I tell all athletes, like you can't perform if you're not healthy, right? So this actually like health comes before performance when I look at it from a sport dietitian perspective. Okay. So in one of your books, you said that uh, looking healthy doesn't mean you are healthy. Oh, yeah. You, you talked about hood. blood tests. <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of, you said there's certain blood tests that you recommend. Is there like as, as a typical panel what we should be looking at you or know, what are some, some? Yeah, a lot of doctors won't do it uh, because it, it, one, it's a lot of add on. Uh, so I, I like getting, you know, the normal thing that you'll get in with a doctor is, is called a CBC, complete blood count. And, and it's fine. It's great. As a sport dietitian, as an athlete, I'm like, well, it only gives me not even half of what I need. So, you know, I need blood lipids, like at the, at the micro level, like I just talked about the, the particle size. I need vitamin D. I need iron stores. I need B vitamins. Um, I would love a genomics test, uh, to kind of see if you have different genetic, uh, on and off switches, if you will. So those types of things physicians don't like ordering. Not only are they more expensive, but it, it usually just requires a little bit more blood being taken. But those for, okay. for athletes like your listeners, you, like you need to get those tested at least once a year, at least like vitamin D and iron for sure. Especially if you're a female, for sure. Just like if you don't pop your hood, I call it popping the hood, right? If you don't understand yeah. what's going on in your body, then how are you going to address any deficiencies, right? And and especially as you age, right? Every decade, or maybe even every five years, your body goes through some major biological processes. Especially for your listeners who are, you know, engaging into that forty-year, fifty-year, sixty-year mark, like stuff happens, right? So we need to constantly be on top of our our not only blood markers but but other biomarkers inside our body. Okay. Um... We talked a lot on the show about increasing fats to fill in calories and mm -hmm. things like that. There's good fats and bad fats. What fats do you want to see people eating? Uh, I would I would challenge you and say there's not necessarily good and bad. There's beneficial and less beneficial. So okay. if, if you are predisposed to a certain disease where maybe saturated fat could have a, a, a huge negative effect, then okay, yeah, it's bad. But the fat research landscape has been changing quite significantly. So what we know is actually saturated fats aren't the quote unquote bad guy anymore. I mean, obviously we still want to limit them, but our cells, cellular matrix still is encompassed with saturated fats. Here's the thing that I, this is my latest kick on fats is we, we've got, you know, we've always classified bad fats as like saturated and trans fats, right? And then the good sure. fats as poly and monounsaturated. Well, the interesting thing is a lot of athletes, here's my little secret, and, and like I said, the bandwagon I've been on lately is looking at the types of vegetable oils because even though they are quote unquote polyunsaturated, which most consumers think is healthy, if it's an oil like safflower, sunflower, corn, those are actually canola. high canola, yep, those are high inflammatory fats, but yes. they're still in the category of these polyunsaturated it saturated fats. So I would say more, you know, try to focus more of your, 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 your daily nutrition plan, your diet and get away from these vegetable fats. Those, if you were to classify bad in that term, that that's how I would classify those right now is those inflammatory fat, uh, inflammatory oils. I forget whose book I read on this topic, but they're saying that your, your EPA to DHA, yep. I think those are the terms, yep. the ratio of that per day if you can keep that at a certain level, you reduce inflammation in your body. Exactly. And if you eat these like canola oils, you just throw that ratio away. Absolutely. That's why grass fed beef is so big. Wild caught yep. fish is so important because those ratios are right in that. Absolutely. There's, it was, so I, do you recommend supplementing with fish oils and things like that? Oh, I think, you know, I'm not a huge pill pusher, so to speak. Yep. I will tell you this though, without any testing, I think almost everybody should be consuming some type of omega-3 fatty acid. Okay. Absolutely. Hands down. Okay. Perfect. Yep. Um, last question before we get to our what point question. Yep. Um, do you have any advice or thoughts on hydration oh. outside of the norm? <laughs> Maybe that's like a loaded <laughs> that's a last totally second question. Loaded. There is so like <laughs> talk about a changing landscape, right? Oh my God. The yeah. hydration and electrolyte. Oh, <laughs> where, how do I even, how do I even start with this one? 
here, here's How about a, just give your general yeah, 30,000 foot view? 30,000 foot view. I believe we walk around in a dehydrated state most throughout the day. And then we try to make up for it while we're on the bike, right? Um, okay. So some people are better than others. But here's the thing. I just think more individuals need to pay attention to hydration based strategies with their food in addition to beverages rather than just focusing on carbohydrate, protein, and fat. Is that, is that a safe response? <laughs> Say that one more time. Yeah. So, so really focusing on hydration principles that actually include food sources um, instead of just saying like your experiment, right? Your experiment was you said, I'm just focusing on carb, protein, fat. Here are my ratios. Here are my percentages. But I didn't hear you really talk about hydration much, right? So that's what no, I'm, I didn't. Yeah. That's what I'm still seeing with athletes still in this space, in the cycling space, and actually just endurance in general is they're not putting hydration on top of the priority list, like they're putting their carb protein ratio, their diets, their whatever you call it. Like it's still a very, very low priority uh, concept. And, and I think it needs to be sitting much, much higher than where it is right now. That would actually probably curb a lot of the issues we're still having with hydration. Huh. Do you have any general recommendations? Uh, I, you know, generally speaking, I think you, if, if you can urinate, you know, outside of a disease state, if you can urinate every couple hours, you're doing pretty good with your hydration throughout the day. That's my, okay. my That's total 50,000 foot view. <laughs> <laughs> okay, perfect. All right. So we have this question on the show. Uh, it's called the what point question. And the idea is if the listener takes all of the advice given by the expert on the show, mm -hmm. how many watts is that worth? Mm -hmm. um, and we always do it based on a, a 300 watt FTP athlete. So just mm -hmm. to give you a, a concept of where that athlete is. Now, your approach is a little bit different. We're really not in improving FTP per se, but what we're doing, we've talked about the same thing with Steve Neal, is we're changing the percentage of FTP that we can utilize burning just fats. Right. Okay, so that's how I'm going to ask you this question. So let's okay. say you've got your typical athlete that comes in and they start, you know, it's a male with a 300 watt FTP and he starts burning carbohydrates around 100 watts. Let's mm -hmm. just use that as an example. I don't know how long it's going to take you, but let's say with you got a year to train this guy, modify his diet. How many watts can you add to his crossover point in mm -hmm. a year? So I will tell you this because I because I measure this right, and I actually geek out a little bit on this, and not necessarily sharing it with athletes every so often. But um, I have actually seen in some cycling, you know, I, I always keep these. What's the highest I've seen in my testing? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. From a cycling perspective, and this was not a pro cyclist by any means, more of a competitive recreational. I've actually seen an improvement in twenty eight percent fat oxidation. Now. Again, to your point, it's taken months to do that, but I, so extrapolating that into your numbers. Um, but I, but I've seen that number be as high as 28% for a cyclist, a little bit higher for a runner. So actually. if they, so if they were at a hundred Watts, they mm -hmm. got to 128. Correct. Correct. I mean, it's more robust, wow, so the higher your FTP, obviously. <laughs> okay. Okay. So. Do you have a, like an example number? So the guy started at what crossover point yeah, and got to where? It was, you know, it was like right around 250. I can't remember exactly. So 250, give or take like 10 watts. So that pushed him well over 300 watts for his, for his metabolic efficiency point. Wow. Yeah. And that's like your typical, you know, competitive recreational rider. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. But, but that's awesome. what we were talking about earlier is, you know, moving that metabolic efficiency point closer to the FTP or LT. Amazing. Yep. All right. Um, this has been an awesome episode. I, I, we've had a lot. People love nutrition episodes, obviously, because they're a great topic. Yeah. And we had somebody write a long time ago to say not to forget about this type of topic. And I knew nothing about it. I read all of your books. So oh, thank you. I want to say that the, all three of your books that I read, you have the metabolic efficiency point or training. Mm -hmm. You have the new, the diet or the um, recipe book. Mm -hmm. And then you have periodized uh Remind me of the title. Nutri periodization. Nutrition Periodization for there Athletes. There it is. Yes. Yep. All great books. So if you're listening to this and you want to learn more about it, definitely start there. Mm -hmm. um, you also offer a lot of services at Energy 
uh, at your business. So yep. talk a little bit about your business, how we can find out more about you and how listeners can come to you and get tested if that's something they want to do. Yeah, absolutely. So as we mentioned earlier, I'm based in Colorado, right outside of Denver. So I actually have a lot of, a lot of athletes fly in the, you know, the night before we do the test the next morning. But my, my, one of my businesses is energy performance, E N R G performance. And I've, I've owned it for many, many moons. Um, I have a, myself and a team of sport dietitians and, and we, this is what we do. Like my whole focus has been my entire career sport nutrition for athletes. And, you know, I've gravitated, I gravitated at a younger age as it, into an endurance athlete. And, you know, I've done Leadville a couple of times running, cycling and triathlon and obstacle course racing, like you name it. Right. So we specialize in endurance athletes and sport nutrition for endurance athletes. We, we don't do any hospital stuff, like none of that stuff. So that in addition to I've used the physiology um, person of, of who I am also in my experience, my education to offer a full battery of physiological testing. Obviously, my specialty is metabolic efficiency testing, but still do some LT testing, do a lot of biomarker testing, adrenal stress, genomics testing, blood work testing. So really, you know, I've, I've crafted my business energy performance as a physiologist sport dietitian based not just one or the other. And I think that's what's really unique about what I've been doing the past 25 years. Yeah, well, so it's they, really, yeah. really cool stuff. Yeah, you can go to the website, you know, enrgperformance.com. You could just Google my name too. I'm, I'm everywhere, so pretty easy to find. You are. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Well, I, this, like I said, great episode. I can't thank you enough for coming on. Uh, this has this been is fantastic. definitely going to be a hit. Yeah, so thank you so much and we will definitely talk soon. All right, I appreciate it, man. Thank you. Yeah, take care. Hey, this is Chris with Flow. When we're not producing this podcast, our team at Flow is designing some of the fastest carbon fiber bicycle wheels in the world. As a thank you for being a listener of our podcast, Faster by Flow, we wanted to offer you 20% off your next purchase of wheels at flowcycling.com. Head over to our website and pick up a set of wheels to make you faster at your next race or ride. Simply use coupon code PODCAST. That's P-O-D-C-A-S-T in all uppercase letters when checking out to get 20% off your order. Thanks again for listening to Faster. We hope you enjoy the show. Thank you for listening to this episode. Be sure to check out episode 32 with equipment manufacturer Nick Salazar from TriRig. In this episode, we discuss the difference between rim brakes and disc brakes, wheels, frame design, and aero bar design. If you are wondering how your equipment can make you faster, this episode is for you. If you enjoy the show, please help us by sharing our podcast and by leaving a rating or review. If you want to learn more about our company, Flow Cycling, please visit us online at flowcycling.com. That's F as in Frank, L-O-C-Y-C-L-I-N-G.com. You can also find us under Flow Cycling on Facebook and Instagram. Until next time, ride safe.